Hello and welcome to the Friday, August 16th, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Wireshark made available the first release candidate for Wireshark 4.4 and uh, DDA wrote about a neat feature that they added. It's a little bit actually related to something that DDA talked about before, how to sort of write custom dissectors for fixed field length protocols. In Wireshark, at the top, typically you have the pane that displays one line per packet, and then you're able to select various fields of the packet to be displayed. And it's pretty straightforward and simple to customize what columns are being displayed. But what has been changed and added in version 4.4 is that you're now also able to add custom columns. What this means is that you basically can use your own little dissectors and uh, display specific ranges of uh, the payload. You can identify an offset and a length and with that, uh, basically add various fields that uh, Wireshark doesn't have a built-in dissector for. Pretty neat feature, and sure, I'll be using that in no time once 4.4 is officially released. And just a quick update on the Microsoft IPv6 vulnerability. Nothing really new to report here. Lots of rumors about possible exploits. No credible exploit that I've seen at this point. Be very careful, of course, as usual, with any fake exploits that may show up. Personal, and I'm completely guessing here, sort of personal guess here, is that we probably got a couple days or so until we have a first, at least sort of a denial of service crash the system exploit. Try to get the patch rolled out or IPv6 at least blocked from your network if you can't disable it uh, before the weekend. And Palo Alto has a nice blog post uh, with uh, new ways to leak your GitHub access tokens. This time they're looking at uh, action artifacts on GitHub. You can define these actions as part of your CI CD pipeline. These actions can do, for example, things like run a linter, but one particular linter that Palo Alto looks at if you're running it in verbose mode creates a, well, very verbose log file that includes GitHub access tokens. And these log files are then often included as part of the artifact created by this particular GitHub action. Also, sometimes developers are not very careful as to what they include in the data they're sending to a GitHub action. It may, for example, include the .git directory and any secrets stored in that directory. There's not so much a vulnerability in GitHub or Git itself, but really more sort of a lack of understanding what's sometimes happening when you're calling these GitHub actions and where the work products, uh, these artifacts are actually ending up and what their content is. And coming back to Microsoft's patch Tuesday quickly, one particular update that fixes a BitLocker security feature bypass vulnerability has since been removed from the patches by Microsoft. It had apparently some incompatibility issues with certain firmware. The update is still available, but has to be applied manually now. Part of the issue is the upcoming expiration of some of the original secure boot certificate authorities. I mentioned that, uh, I think a week or so ago. So uh, this apparently affects some of these updates, but refer to Microsoft's uh, knowledge base article and the show notes contain a link for any details. And Solar Winds released an update for its web help desk. This update fixes an already exploited deserialization vulnerability that may lead to remote arbitrary code execution. Well, and today uh, we're going to talk about some research again, but this time it's not a student. I have with me here at SCOTUS our president because, well, our faculty, of course, is conducting research too. And Ed, uh, you just uh, published a book actually about some research you did on ethics. Uh, can you take a, a little bit through what the book is about and uh, what it's talking about? 
Sure, sure. First off, uh, it's great to be on the podcast again. Uh, I love talking with you, Johannes. Uh, you always bring such great insights. Um, and and uh, yes, I had a book come out. It came out June 18th. And then an audio book came out uh, about a week ago uh, that's uh, directly um, taken from that. And it is on cybersecurity ethics. It's a project that I've been working on since 2021. So about three years in the making. Um, I was approached by Dr. Paul Maurer. He is the president of Montreat College. So he came to me, you know, me being president of the Science Technology Institute College. And he said, hey, there is a distinct need for a cyber security ethics framework in our industry. So he and I spent over two years researching this and working on the book. We downloaded and looked at um, various ethics frameworks, including the GIAC ethics framework. There's a lot that are associated with certifications. So we looked at the GIAC one. We looked at the ISC squared one. We looked at a whole bunch of other ones. And um, we also looked at you know other industries ethical statements and codes, um, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, for example, or, uh, you know, various other ones associated with law or uh, with, um, you know, military engagement and so forth. And we, we tried to come up with something that, that was suited for the cybersecurity industry based on real world experiences that we've seen uh, in our careers. You know, I taught for SANS for over 25 years. And um, in that time, I'd have students come to me with ethical dilemmas. You know, this thing has happened. What is your advice? That strange thing has happened. I'm concerned. What is your advice? And, uh, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about it. And this was an effort to read what the industry literature had to say about that and what I've seen students asking about and then diffuse it together into a single ethical framework. And I know we're just on audio, but I, I just have to hold the book up here. It's in my hands. Um, again, it was a long time in the making. And, and what it, it aims to do is to arm people with a framework for ethical decision making. So when they see hard stuff, they, they kind of have some insights in how to handle different cases. It's very case study centric. It's um, very structured. Um, my co-author on it, Dr. Paul Maurer, um, he has a PhD in poli sci and a master's of divinity. And of course, I bring the, the tech nerd side of things to it. Um, and it was a great collaboration. And we argued and wrestled and fought in a all very positive manner to try to come up with this, this framework. And that's what it's all about. It's all published in this book, The Code of Honor, Embracing Ethics in Cybersecurity. Yeah, so I, I like the cross-discipline approach. And I think that that's something that uh, always helps us to sort of get a little bit out of our uh, little, you know, view of the world and uh, looks at the broader implications. Uh, what's the sort of a specific issue where that actually educated you as to how others see our industry and uh, how it sort of affects uh, or should affect what we are doing? Sure. I mean, there's the old uh, Spider-Man saying, right, with great power comes great responsibility. And cybersecurity practitioners now have great power. Um, so some examples that have come directly from my students of, of ethical dilemmas that come up. One is um, you've discovered a vulnerability. How do you responsibly disclose that? And there are frameworks for responsible disclosure. That's very good. But what if, what if the vendor doesn't respond? What if the vendor doesn't care? What do you do then? Um, the book addresses several scenarios like that, that I've had friends and students have to address. And one of the big recommendations there is to reach out to someone else that you might know in the industry, perhaps uh, me, or perhaps somebody at the Internet Storm Center, one of the handlers. Um, there are infrastructures in place and and people in place that can help if you found a serious vulnerability in your own understanding of it, as well as maybe get the attention of the appropriate vendor or authorities. So the book provides some counsel on that. Or another one that I used to get all the time when I was teaching uh, GCIH, uh, the incident handling class 504. Um, here, here's the scenario. Our company just passed an audit. Maybe it's a you know PCI assessment and they passed, or maybe it was an internal audit of something and they passed, but they shouldn't have. The security team knows that maybe the auditor missed something and yet we passed. What do I do? Do I act like a whistleblower? Do I call management? Do I call the audit team? 
what can I do to approach that kind of scenario? So, the, so the book is is full of different issues and scenarios like that, and it's it's meant for practitioners, but also leadership. You know, another one that the book addresses is there's budget cuts, right? And and you have to make some decisions about do you cut the budget for security? That's an easy one to target because it's you know not going to directly impact getting product out the door, but it could destroy the company if you cut budget the budget for security too much. So we we have dozens and dozens of case studies. Uh, and they're, they're, the case studies themselves are based on real world cases. Um, but we've changed the names and kind of blended some of them together for efficiency and efficacy. It also goes over some folks that um, have done some really wonderful things from an ethics perspective, uh, kind of holding them up as a spotlight. Like, um, for example, we talk about Dan Kaminsky and the, the work that he did years ago in responsibly disclosing and, and working with the community and vendors to deal with a big DNS issue back in 2008, 2009. So it's that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Hippocratic Oath earlier. And of course, that the overarching principle is always do no harm. And I think right. everybody can agree uh, that's sort of what we should strive towards. But uh, sometimes it's really sort of, you no know, do the lesser harm or, sure. you know, it's uh, no matter what you do or what you not do, you're causing harm. With our you know, students, we sometimes have with research projects that problem where they find a vulnerability, they want to disclose it, the vendor is not responding. So, are we now going to publish that research? Uh, be- and uh, not publishing it, of course, hurts the community, hurts the student too, because uh, they now don't have that research kind of to to show to others. Uh, and I, I think there are a lot of examples. Like you also mentioned, the great power uh, that we all have. Uh, also. Uh, there's always the issue, of, I'm not sure if you covered this in the book, of uh, hacking back. That's sort of one yes. of those ethical dilemmas that's oh, coming. We up. talk about that. Yeah, we definitely talk about that yeah. because you might you you might hack back and say, well, we can stop this nefarious person and therefore save other people from suffering from an attack. Yeah. And we do talk about that sort of um, cyber vigilantism and recommend against it. Now, I, I should point out that the book is focused on the civilian space. Yeah. You know, whether it be civilian government or commercial, it focuses on that. The book would be twice as long if, or, or maybe three or four times as long, is if we took into account all the various military ethics and such that come up. Those are important, but we wanted to focus. I think we came in at 160, no, it's 100 and, I'm looking at it right now, 190 pages, uh, 198 pages. Um, and uh, again, every chapter ends with a scenario and then ask specific questions about how you'd approach that scenario. So you could use it in sort of a group interactive thing, but it's really built around what we call the cybersecurity code. That's why the thing's called the code of honor. And, um, you know, the cybersecurity code consists of, you know, eight essential statements uh, in a specific order about how to approach ethical dilemmas. The first one is I will treat all people with dignity and respect. So focusing on the people. Next is I will seek the best interest of others. So focusing on, on helping others and not just for yourself. And it goes on from there, including things like I will endeavor to exercise patience, wisdom, and self-control in all situations. I will not steal and I will do everything in my power to prevent theft in all its forms. And I will protect and respect the privacy of others. Again, that's sort of a thumbnail sketch, but it's those with case studies on each of those and then where they intermingle, uh, which is where, where, where it really gets interesting. That sounds great. And you know, I like it, sort of these first principles, I guess, you know, these, uh, these sort of base cyber kind of where you sort of distill it down to, hey, these are the rules that we actually want to follow and uh, make it then a little bit more sort of objective how you make the decision. That, uh, that's that's the idea. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I want to put this out there. The funding for the book, because, you know, we had to travel back and forth uh, while writing the book. Uh, Paul Maurer, my co-author, visited me here in New Jersey, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 times um, to to work on the book, you know, for a day or two at a time. So that that funding, I make no money on the book myself. Um, all of the um, proceeds from the book uh, and any remaining funding go um, to getting the book in people's hands, as well as to provide scholarships in cybersecurity for students. Um but the, the funding to create the book, all that travel and such, was provided by the NSA. Um, and you might say, well, why would the NSA 
fund a book on cybersecurity ethics? Well, um, <laughs> you recall a, a certain situation uh, where an inter- insider there caused some, I don't want to name him, but uh, caused some issues for them several years ago. So they have a distinct interest in making sure that their personnel and other cybersecurity practitioners uh, are well-versed in ethics. Um, so that, that was sort of the impetus of the funding for this. Uh, they wanted us to write a book that the, um, the colleges that are designated as centers for academic excellence, um, there's about 400 such colleges with that designation from the NSA, including the Science Technology Institute College, yes. <laughs> we're, we're a CAE. Um, they wanted something that those colleges could use to teach ethics. Um, each college is given a copy of the book, and if they want to adapt it into their curriculum, they are welcome to do so. We actually created a curriculum associated with it for those colleges, too. But that's not to say that it's a college textbook. It can be used as such, but we designed it to be a practical handbook for cybersecurity ethics. Um, again, some colleges can and will use it. Also, we've had some CISOs. Uh, in various commercial enterprises, say that they want to adopt it and adapt it for their own organization. Again, our hope was to pull it all together into one code. It does remind me of that old XKCD um, comic strip where it's like, there's 14 different standards here. We should create one that's just the one for all of them. And that's how the 15th standard was born. (laughs) And and I suppose there is some risk of that. Uh, You know, we tried to boil down the essence of various codes of ethics that we saw in the industry and outside the industry to try to pull them all together into one. And we hope this one will be very, very useful for a lot of people and not just another ethical book uh, associated with cybersecurity. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'll add links to the show notes if anybody's interested. So uh, thanks uh, for joining me here, Ed. Hey, thank you so much, Johannes. And people can download the code itself, the, not the whole book, but just the code of honor. You know, it's like a one page thing. So if they want to see that, we could put a link in there for that too. But thank yeah, you, we'll Johannes. Yeah. Appreciate thank it, you. Dr. J. Always good talking with you. Yeah. Bye. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday.